be in the house of the Lord, feel the presence of the Lord, amen, with the saints of God here, amen, hear the prayers of faith, amen, know that God is going to do something, amen, know that God is going to do something, thinking about prayers, I have a friend back, back Michigan, well from Michigan, he lives in Florida now, but his sister had some kind of a stroke back a few months ago, Judine, and um, I can't remember if I asked for prayer here or not for that. I think that I did, but I don't remember. But at any rate, she had to, she almost died. She had to be living with my friend's brother, and she was totally incapacitated. And when I called, I think it was last week, to talk to him, he said, I said, how's she doing? He says, she's completely better. It's amazing. And I said, well, Prayer makes a difference. Yeah. Prayer makes a difference. I know that I did pray for her. I couldn't remember if I asked for prayer here, but I did pray. And he said it was amazing. And so she's, she'll be able to live on her own. And they found her in a chair, you know, immobile from a stroke. And, and so God is, God is able to do a lot. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So when... People were asking about their prayers and just talking about it. That, that came to my mind. God is faithful. And we never know what he's going to do. We're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. Not the whole book, but the seven churches. We're going to spend a little time, probably a few weeks, looking at that. So we're going to open up our Bible here tonight to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 4 through 20. Most of chapter 1 we're going to read here tonight. And we really, you have to read chapter 1 to understand some of the things that are being said in chapter 2 and 3. So in order to understand what the Lord is saying to the church and where he's coming from, if you don't read chapter 1, you don't get all those details. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw the seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like on divine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in the strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, 
and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. Praise God. So let's understand that here tonight, looking at the book of Revelation, written around 96, 98 AD. There are some people that think it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem, but I don't see that that's the way it is from the evidence that's there. John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, an isle off the coast of Turkey, west, western side of Turkey there, for the word of God and testimony of Jesus Christ. In verse, chapter 1, verse 9, he says, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. His banishment took place during the reign of Domitian, around 81 to 96 AD. And we understand when we're looking at persecutions, and I've heard different people say different things, even apostolic, but it doesn't seem from what I've read in history that Nero's persecution went beyond Rome. It was localized to Rome. It was not a, an empire-wide persecution, where the persecution under Domitian was a empire-wide persecution. So that makes, makes it a different persecution. This is the persecution that John was involved in. Amen. There's also a tradition that John was boiled in oil, but he survived before being banished to Patmos. Amen. So when we start to look at these seven churches, there's some keys in, in chapter 1, and I've laid them out here, some of the things, not all of them, but it helps us understand. So in the address to the seven churches, each one starts out with a, an address from the Lord, and he takes an attribute out of chapter 1 when he addresses each church. So this is why it's important to look at chapter 1 to understand some of the things that are said. So, for instance, in, in Ephesus, in chapter 1, verse 20, he says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he which hath the seven stars in his right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In order to understand fully what he's saying, I've got to back up to verse 20 of chapter 1. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sayest, sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So what he's saying here when he starts out with Ephesus, and the reason he probably takes what he says there is because Ephesus is probably the beginning of all these seven churches. They all probably came to be when Paul started the church in Ephesus and preached there for seven or three years. In, in Acts 19 and 10, it says, in all Asia heard the word of God. All these seven churches are located in Asia. So even though we can't look in the book of Acts and say, here's the church of Laodicea and here's the church of Smyrna, we do know that Paul preached in a way that it went out to all of Asia. So when he starts with Ephesus, he's starting with the starting point of all of these churches that he's going to address. Now when we look at Smyrna, it says, Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith he, saith the first and the last, which was dead and alive. So when we go over to verse 18 of chapter 1, it says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. So something out of the vision which John sees, in most cases it comes right out of the vision which John sees when, when he starts to address the church, there's something taken from that vision. So that vision in chapter 1 is a composite of what is a com composite picture that gives us keys to what is going to be said to these churches. In Pergamos, he talks about the two-edged sword. So in Pergamos 1 and 16, he says, 
He says, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. Okay, and if you're just reading that, you wonder what what is it he's talking about. But if you've read chapter 1 and you go back to chapter 1 to look at that, you see that there's a two-edged sword there, verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So again, when he's not just saying things out of nowhere, but these things are being taken from the vision in chapter 1. In Revelation, in the church of Thyatira, chapter 1, verse 14, he takes something. And he in chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God, who has eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Again, it's coming from the vision in chapter 1 that John has seen. In Sardis, he talks in chapter 3, verse 1, unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write these things, saith he, that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. And again, if you have read chapter 1 and you have that in your mind, you understand that the seven spirits refers back to something in chapter 1. There's seven spirits before the throne. And he says, I've got the seven spirits. So part of it is his authority. And really, the vision is showing the Lord as the great high priest. And we'll break that down probably next week in another lesson. But he's standing there as the high priest. He's in the midst of the churches, in the midst of the candlestick. Amen. And he's, because he is the high priest, he's got any, he, because he is the beginning of the church and the end of the church, the beginning and the ending, the Alpha and the Omega, he's got a right to judge them. And as he judges each one, he takes a part or an attribute out of the vision to talk about his authority to judge. So the church of Smyrna, they think, you know, you're dead, you're crushed, you're going through all these things. Listen, I know about being dead. I'm he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Amen. So it goes on like that. Philadelphia is a little different there because it talks about the key of David in Revelation 3 and 7. He says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that open and no man shutteth, and, and shutteth and no man openeth. Now it is a singular key, but notice over in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of uh, death. Listen, if you got the keys to hell and death, you can probably open the other doors too. Amen. So you got the key of David, in other words, what it's saying. Amen. The key of David anointing, you know, the, the, the prophecy, the promise of God, he's got those keys, but he's got the power to open and to shut doors. This is what this is talking about. And then finally, in Laodicea, Chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And in Revelation 1 and 5, you go back, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. So we've just picked out a few of those things there, just to give you an understanding why we're looking at chapter 1 in order to start this study to look at the seven churches. Now, right now, I'm not planning on going beyond chapter 3, except as we study a church, if there's something in Revelation that reflects back to that, we'll pull that scripture out. But we're not really looking at the trumpets and the seals and the vials of wrath. That's not the plan of this study. But this is to look at the seven churches because there's something there that we need to understand. Amen. Now, the word revelation, I think a lot of you already know this, comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, which means to lay bare or to unveil. It's an unveiling. It's, it's a revealing. This is what revelation means. This is 
the universal meaning within the New Testament. So the book of Revelation, if you look at the first chapter, a lot of people call it Revelations. It's not the book of Revelations. It's singular, the book of Revelation, not book of Revelations. The book of Revelation is a singular title, and, and the title kind of, it says the revelation of St. John the Divine, but really verse 1 tells you what the book is really about. Okay, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The purpose of the book of Revelation is not really so much to tell us about seals and trumpets and vials of wrath and things that are going to come. As much as to let us understand who Jesus is and that he's in control of all of it. He's in control of the seven seals. He's the only one that can open them. No man was found in heaven that could open the seals. John started to weep. He said, weep not, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open up these seals. The interesting thing is, is when he turns to see the lion, he does not see a lion, but sees a lamb. Telling us something about how God deals with situations. A lot of times we want to fight as a lion when we need to be a lamb. Hallelujah. Praise God. Sometimes we want to fight as a lion and we need to be a lamb. Praise God. Amen. But the point is, and, and from the seals comes trumpets, and from trumpets comes the vials of wrath. Amen. So, and I know there are people that think that they're all consecutive in that, but every time I read the book of Revelation, I don't see that they're consecutive. I see that the seventh seal leads to the first trumpet and so forth, and the seventh trumpet leads to the seventh vial. And, and if people have different understandings, that's fine. That's just the way that I understand it when I've looked at it. Okay, and so it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The real purpose of the book is to reveal who Jesus is. Amen. But Revelation 19 and 10 gives, gives us a little insight into that. Revelation 19 and 10 says, And I fell down at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other, in other words, all the prophecies God was giving in the past and all the ones that have not been fulfilled really revolve around what God intended to do through the person of Jesus Christ. The first prophecy in the Bible, the seed of the woman, is about Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we go on and we look, and so the spirit of prophecy, the force moving, the reason behind prophecy is for what God has intended to do through the humanity of Jesus Christ. Look with me in Revelation, or not of Revelation, but Ephesians 3 and 11. We've looked at this scripture a few times recently. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, eternal means before time, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Or unless, we're, unless he means eternal from that point on forward, but I, it looks like Paul's talking about time past also. So it's telling us that God had a plan before time existed in relation to humanity in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we understand that. Okay, in other words, God's prophecy, as we've already said, it points to his plan through Jesus Christ. Another scripture in the book of Revelation, Revelation 13 and 8, that brings this out. So Revelation 13 and 8 says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, meaning the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain, from the foundation of the world. In other words, 
From the beginning of God's creation, he's had the idea of a book of life, the Lamb's book of life, people that get in it through the blood of the Lamb, God's purpose in Christ. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay, Revelation chapter 1 reveals also, when we go back and look, it reveals Jesus as the one God. Now, you can get people that, you know, start to look at that and say, well, there's the Trinity, but let's look at it and see. Okay, so when we look in Revelation 1, 4, and 5, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, which is, which was, which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. So you have a lot of people say there's the Trinity right there. You got the Father, which is, which was, which is to come, seven spirits, the Holy Ghost, and Jesus Christ. But it doesn't say the Father. And as we read down and we, we analyze this and think about what we know about the Bible, the first thing to understand is, who wrote this? John. John's a Jew. No good Jew is going to write about a trinity. He's got to have a, there's got to be a revelation someplace in the Bible that says that God is a trinity and there's not one to be found. And so John, who knows God, who's seeing this vision, is writing this. He's, a, he's been raised, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And John's writing are the strongest oneness writings of any of the Gospels. So when we start to look into the, into the Gospel of John, we start to see in John 8, 58, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. All he's saying right there, I am, is he's just saying, he's claiming the name of Jehovah. Because Jehovah means the self-existent one, which means the one that is, the I am. That's what Jehovah means. So John 8, 58, right off the bat, John is saying Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the great I am. He is the one from the beginning. Again, in John 10 and 30, he says, I and my Father are one. Same guy's writing book of Revelation. I and my Father are one. And again, you have people that say, well, they just mean one in purpose, one in unity, one in, one in spirit. You know, they're, they're both just doing the same thing. No, it's more than that. Look what happens in verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Who's he talking to? He's talking to one God, Jews. So when he says, I am a father of one, they don't have, they're not interpreting like we're just in the same mind. I'm just a prophet that's in agreement with God. They're not interpreting it all like that. They're taking it to mean he is claiming to be the God that spoke to Moses and Abraham. Praise God. This is why they want to stone him. Amen. And so again, again we go to John 12, 44. And we see that Jesus said, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. The only thing they can see is Jesus. Praise God. Again, in John 14, verses 7 through 10, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? In other words, what do you, how can you ask me that, Philip? If you see me, you do see the Father. Amen. And then he goes on to say, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and Father in me? The words that I speak, I speak not of myself, 
but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Amen. So Jesus was claiming. So when Jesus, when John writes the book of Revelation, he can't be saying something different about God than he's already said in the Gospels and in his other writing. So we understand that it does, it's not pointing out to the Trinity. It can't mean that. Amen. Because John was a one God apostolic. Another thing that lets us understand, you can't just take it all at face value, is it talks about seven spirits before the throne. Go back to Revelation chapter 1. So Revelation 4, 1 and 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Again, there's no place where the Bible talks about seven spirits. God being seven spirits, God is always one. And when we talk about, besides the book of Revelation, okay, that talks about seven spirits of God, so we understand it's symbolic. And the New Testament declares that the Spirit of God, there's only one Spirit of God. If we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. He says, for there is one Spirit. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So he's saying right off the bat, there's only one Spirit when it comes to God. And again, if you go back to the definition John gives of God, God is a spirit, not God is spirits. And God is holy. Not they are different persons that are holy. So if God is holy and God is a spirit, to me, it makes sense the Holy Spirit is just the spirit of God. It's not another spirit. So there's only one spirit. So when it starts talking about seven spirits, it's got to be a symbolic application of the Spirit of God that God is trying to say to us. Again, we can go and look in Ephesians 2 and 18, seeing about one spirit. Ephesians 2 and 18, for through him, through Jesus, we have access by one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 4 and 4, there is one body and one spirit. Amen. So when we, when we look at this, we understand that that's, that's got to be a symbolic meaning. So in, under, in order to understand grace out of the churches that are in Asia, from him which is, which was, which come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, that John is not trying to say that God is persons, but John is trying to tell us something else. Now, does that make sense? I'm not sure if that makes sense to you. To me, it's clear-cut logic. Praise God, it's, it's, it's clear-cut. Okay, written 1 and 8 makes clear that Jesus is the one that is and was and is to come. So that's the first thing that happens there is when you look at that, you understand that the passage itself is saying that Jesus is the one that is and was and is to come. So Revelation 1 and 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come. And verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds. So it's letting us understand that the which is, which was, is really Jesus. Amen. It's really the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Remember, the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's not one God among gods. He's not a second person in the Godhead. He's not a person in the Godhead, period. He is the God which is, which was, and which is to come. Praise God. Amen. And he's also called the Almighty. There can only be one Almighty. Amen. 
Some people think that's not enough verses because uh, somebody said, well, no verses say Jesus is almighty. And I told them, well, Revelation 1 8 does. Well, that's the only one. It still says he's almighty. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. So again, Revelation chapter 1 is revealing the seven spirits. They're symbolic. They're symbolic. Why is it talking about seven spirits? Well, first of all, the book of Revelation is filled full of seven, isn't it? And seven is a number of divine, or not divine, but spiritual perfection or completion. So what it's trying to say is it's trying to tell us about seven meaning spiritual fullness or perfection. Okay, so seven is God's number of divine completion. The book of Revelation shows us Jesus has the seven spirits. All right, so if we go and look in Revelation 3 and 1, John to the angel of the church, which is a church in Sardis, write these things, saith he, which has the seven spirits of God. He's got them. He's got them. All right, what's it trying to say? When we get the Holy Ghost, the Bible says we get a measure. We get the earnest. Okay, that's what we get when we get the Holy Ghost. We get a down payment. We get a measure. The Gospel of John says he's got the spirit without measure. Amen. When you read the Gospel of John, it's trying to say he's got the fullness of the spirit. It's not even talking about individual gifts. It's saying he's got all the spirit you can have. Why? Because he is God. He is God. Praise God. So then when we look over in Revelation 5 and 6, it says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, and the seven, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now we know that Jesus is the Lamb of God, right? We do know that, right? John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God. Okay. A lamb is something created, isn't it? Right? A, la a lamb can die. Jesus died. It's talking about the sacrificial nature of Jesus. It's talking about what God did as in humanity to save us. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Because the Lamb is talking about the humanity that God created to fulfill his plan. Revelation is letting us know he's not just part of God. He's got all of God. He's got seven eyes. He knows everything. He sees everything. He understands everything. Eyes are wisdom, seeing, understanding. He's got seven horns. He's got all power. He's got all anointing. That's what the seven mean. He's got the fullness of wisdom, that humanity. And so it's like talking about Colossians 2 and 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Praise God. Amen. So this is why he's got seven. Because when it starts out, it's the revelation of God, revelation of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? That's always the big discussion. Among Christianity, that's the big division, who Jesus is. Is he just an anointed man? Is he the second person in the Godhead? Is he really God? Amen. That, that's really, it, that's the dividing factor, who Jesus is. How you baptize is determined by who you think Jesus is. That's the dividing factor. Jesus didn't say you're going to be persecuted because you read your Bible or because you believe in the God of the Bible. He said, ye shall be persecuted for my namesake. He really means for understanding who I am. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So Jesus, when well, we look at him again, what does, what does Revelation talk about? Which is, which is what's come. Why does it say that? You know, why is it saying that? 
is trying to help us understand that Jesus is both God and man. He's not part man. He was all man. He's not part God. He's all God. He's fully God. He's fully man. We can't figure out where the humanity stops and the, the God starts because it's an integrated God-man, a real man, a real God. Again, you have all these different ideas when you start to look in church history. Was it a real body or was it just like a real body? You have all these different doctrines of that. But Paul says we've been reconciled through the body of his flesh. Real flesh. Real humanity. Amen. Praise God. And the Bible also lets us understand he's God. He's coming, which is, which was, which is to come. He's coming with the cloud, just like Titus 2 and 14. Amen. It's talking about the great God, you know, our hope, our blessed hope, the great God and Savior. There's not two coming, but one is coming. It's Jesus, the great God and Savior. Amen. So we're talking about the book of Revelation. Let's talk a little bit about the seven churches in general terms. They're, they're historical churches. And I think most of us understand that. But again, you have people that will make an allegory out of the Bible, out of what the Bible says. And when you make an allegory out of what the Bible says, you can really make it into anything you want it to be. So when you're trying to interpret the Bible, the rule is most times you take it at face value unless there's something in the passage or text that should lead you to take it in a different way, like seven spirits. No place else in the Bible do we hear God talking about I am spirit, but the Bible says spirit. The spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Amen? So, and God says, I'll put my spirit on him. Okay? It's not spirit. On the day of Pentecost, this is the spirit. This is what God said. He poured out his spirit, Acts 2.17, on all flesh. Amen. And so when we read seven spirits, we have to go, what's going on? But the key is, number one, the number seven is a special number in the Bible, right from the first two chapters of Genesis, right? God rests the seventh day. And we see it on and on. It's spiritual perfection. A spiritual completion. Amen. So we're looking at this. God, God gives an address to each church. Each address to each church is specific. So he's dealing with each congregation. They're historical churches. They don't represent spiritual ages. So sometimes you'll have meet people that say, well, the church at Ephesus, that's not really talking about the church there. It's talking about the spiritual age, the beginning church in the first hundred years or so, and then got Ephesus, Smyrna, and then Smyrna represents the persecuted church, you know, during the Roman persecution, and then Pergamos represents, you know, the beginning of the church after that. No, that's not really what, what the Bible's saying. The Bible's taken seven real congregations that existed at the time when John was writing this, that most of those had been in, to, had been in existence since around the time that the church at Ephesus was founded. The Paul, some of them, you know, the book of Ephesus, or the, you know, the book of Ephesus, a lot of Ephesians, sometimes people believe that was written to the, the Laodiceans. Paul says in one place, the Colossians, I think it is, shared this epistle with the Laodiceans. So that church is already established at that point, and so... We know these churches existed, but what God is trying to tell us about here is seven, again, represents God's complete picture or fullness. He's trying to show us these are all the conditions possible for any given congregation. These are all the different situations that could ever ha happen as a congregation Spiritual congregations, here's what, how congregations can get into this. They can start out. Remember, all seven of those are apostolic churches. 
Now, sometimes we forget. We look around and see our problems, and we say, well, I thought we were supposed to be apostolic. But look at the book of Corinthians, and they're apostolic. Right? They got a lot of problems. Amen. In fact, most of the epistles are written to solve a problem. We, we, we wouldn't have a lot of the epistles if there was problems in the early church. We could just add the book of Acts and then cruise right on to the rapture. But the epistles are the result that there are problems that occur, and here's how you ought to deal with them. Amen. So all the churches, as he gives an address to each church, there's, he says to them, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So even though he addresses Ephesus and says, here's your situation, here's what you need to do, he finishes by saying, hear what the Spirit says, not to the church, but to the churches. So even though Pergamos, you know, Sardis, Smyrna, all those other churches aren't being addressed. He says to them, listen to what I'm saying to them, because this would be you tomorrow or next year. And every one of them, he does that. When we look at all, all the churches, we can see it in Revelation 2 and 7. He that hath near, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Verse 11, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says on to the churches. So when he's talking to Smyrna, it's for Ephesus too. And it goes on through all of those. So it's not just that if I've got this condition, let's look at this, but let's look at the whole picture because God is talking to his church as a whole body. Amen? Praise God. So now John's vision starts with Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks. So we go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like on to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about the peps, with a golden girdle. So girdle about the paps is the key. That it, This is the high priest, because the normal girding was around the waist, but the Jewish priests girded themselves around the breasts. So that's the key there that lets you understand that what he's seeing is Jesus in the role of the high priest. This is what's going on there. And so he's now, is, since he's the high priest, he's the great mediator the great intercessor, the founder, beginning, and the ending, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the first begotten of the dead. Amen. If we're, born, if we're in him, we were born again, we expect to be begotten of the dead, eventually from the dead ourselves. If we're not alive when the rapture occurs, but he's the forgotten of the dead. Praise God. So he's standing in the midst. And then verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now angels in this case means the pastors or the overseers. It does not mean a heavenly angel. Okay, and how, how can we say that that's true? The reason we could say that's true is if God was going to give the message to angels, he wouldn't tell John to write it down and I'll give it to an angel. God would speak it to the angel himself. All right? So the word angel just means messenger. Messengers. Malachi 2 and 7. Under the high priest, my messenger. Same Hebrew word that's translated in other places in the Old Testament, angel. See, so it's a valid thing to call. These, these are the pastors of the congregation. The candlestick represents the congregation itself. Again, it's the type of the candlestick in the tabernacle, isn't it? There's, it's not one piece anymore. 
because the congregations are spread across the world in different places, but, but it is all one, and Jesus is in the midst of it. He's beholding his church. It's letting us understand that Jesus is watching. He's watching the church. He knows what's going on in his body. Amen. And he'll speak to us if we'll listen. He'll talk to us if we'll listen. We'll seek him. He'll give us the direction that we need for whatever situation a congregation can find itself in. Praise God. Amen. Thanks. Thank you. Jesus is right. To me, that's a comfort. If I am serious about living for God, amen, God is going to give me the direction that I need, and God is going to give you the direction. So he's in the midst of those candlesticks, and seven is representative of all the complete church there. Amen. One last thing that we're going to look at is just kind of the general format of the different addresses that he gives to the church. So each, each letter that he has to each of those churches has, has a general format. And so the general format is the Lord addresses the church, and as we saw, he takes part of his authority or part of his address reaches back to things in chapter 1. Okay, then he's got a com commendation for the church. If, if the church is doing good, he tells them what's good. And if there's a problem, he tells them what the problem is. Okay, now that's one thing, that's one way you can discern whether God's in it. When it's the devil, he just tells you the problem. Yeah. Yeah, all he wants you to do is look at the problem, be aware of the problem, feel guilty of the problem, feel condemned for the problem. But if it's really Jesus, he'll tell you, this is what you're doing good. Here's the problem. But here's what you need to do to fix the problem. Repent. Mm -hmm. Repent. Here's what you need. I'm not going to just tell you, yeah, you're no good, you're, you're, you're messing up, and leave you feeling guilty, but I, he's going to tell you, this is what you need to do, and if you don't do it, here's what's going to happen. Praise God. So there's a rebuke, not to all of them, but if the rebuke is required, then it's there. And then there's a correction. Then there's a promise. He that overcometh. Now that's, that's see, so there's, there's a couple things that are important in these seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh to him. There's different promises. Okay, depending on what we have to overcome, there are different promises that God gives us. But the point is, is even if you're in an apostolic church, there are some things you must listen to the Spirit in order to overcome. Praise God. And so we're going to stop there tonight. But that's, that's a, an introduction and we'll look a little bit more at the vision, you know, the, the second half of chapter one, a little bit more to bring out a little bit of that next week. And then the following week, or maybe next week, we'll get into the church at Ephesus a little bit. And what I'm thinking, but I don't know, is that it'll take us at least seven or eight more weeks, one week for each church, so that we can cover in detail, but it might turn out that we'll do two churches in a week. I don't know yet, because I don't have it all written out, and I'll see what God's going to do. But let's let's stand here tonight. Amen. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light unto our path. Oh, we worship you, Lord God. Hallelujah. You are worthy. You are worthy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough to wash us from our sins, to call us to be high priests and kings, Lord God, that you've ordained that, Lord. And, Lord, we know that you're coming back. Help us to be ready and looking. Help us to have our ears turned to what you're saying in the Spirit, Lord, and help us understand that there are things to overcome, but we are well able through you in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. God bless you. Dismiss in the name of the Lord.